Hello, I'm Karen Pascal. I'm the Executive Director of the Henry Nowen Society. Welcome to a new episode of Henry Nowen, Now and Then. Our goal at the Society is to extend the rich spiritual legacy of Henry Nowen to audiences around the world. We invite you to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Because we're new to the world of podcasts, taking time to give us a review or a thumbs up will mean a great deal to us and will help us extend our reach to more people. This week, my guest is best-selling English poet, writer, Malcolm Geit. Malcolm has sold over 40,000 volumes of his poetry. He's also a singer, songwriter, Anglican priest, and an academic. Malcolm Geit is a life fellow of Gyrton College at Cambridge. He also teaches for the Divinity Faculty in Cambridge and lectures widely in England and North America on theology and literature. I first saw Malcolm Guide in action a few years ago here in Toronto at a gathering for Image Magazine. Malcolm filled the room with poetry, wit, and wisdom, all the overflow of his own rich and dynamic spiritual life. It was an inspiring and uplifting event. Today we're going to look at three of Malcolm's books, Sounding the Seasons, 70 Sonnets for the Christian Year, David's Crown, Sounding the Psalms, and his newest book, Lifting the Veil, Imagination and the Kingdom of God. Thank you. Well, I, I I was very glad you drew my attention to that uh, um, lecture because although I'd read some of Nowen's books, I'd never actually heard his speaking voice. So just to start with, it was so moving to hear this warm human voice and to see indeed how he, and hear rather, how he warmed to his task, how he began in some ways quite quietly and hesitantly. And then as he moved forward, and particularly when he talked about the move from fear to love, about the way love casts out fear. I mean, his great theme was whether we make our home in the house of fear or whether we make our home in the house of love and how love comes to us. I I just felt his voice itself warming and um, it was a very powerful experience to listen to it. Uh, In a sense now, if I go back and look, say, at the return of the prodigal son, I'm going to hear that voice. Uh, which is which is wonderful. Um, I, I think it, it, it struck me particularly that he he gives quite early on in that lecture a very close reading of the opening chapter of John's Gospel, and particularly on the the question to Jesus, Master, where are you staying? Where is your home? And Jesus saying, Come and see. And then he he builds that up, takes into John that sense of welcoming and homecoming. But but the the paradox, astonishing that, that God. God comes and makes his home in and with us, even when our, when we feel homeless, he can still find a home with us. And um, that paradox I thought was beautifully uh, articulated. In my own book, Lifting the Veil, I, I, I make parallels between the incarnation and the way poetry tries to make, to body forth uh, the form of things unknown, to, to, to make, as Shakespeare says, for area nothing, a local habitation and a name. So I found I found all kinds of consonances with that lecture. But I suppose right at the core of what I felt there, and I know this is what's attracted so many people to Henry Nowen, is that although he's fully versed in, you know, in psychology and depth psychology, and he's really interested in, you know, he understands quite a lot of secular wisdom about the working of the human psyche. But all of that is at the service of Jesus. The the figure that you feel is right at the heart of what he has to say is the compelling figure of Jesus himself. I think you've grasped very well. I've always said myself that I almost feel like it's a plumb line in Henry, that he has this this Jesus at the very center. And out of that comes what he creates. I see the same in you. I, I see a great similarity here in terms of the two of you. Here you are both priests and and uh, and writers. And I wonder if you, like Henry, have had a lifetime of processing your world, your faith, your thoughts through your pen. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I suppose one of the things that makes you a writer 
is the realization that it's the very act of bodying forth and writing that makes you discover what you know and discover what you believe. That you have these half-formed thoughts, you have this sense of, of I- insight, but it's not really there in the world until it's articulated. And sometimes, I, particularly with the art of poetry, I find, I mean, if I already know absolutely before I've written a poem what the poem is going to be about and how it's going to work and how it's going to conclude, if I know everything about it before I write it, then it's not a poem, it's just a note to self. Whereas if I feel entranced by an image or led forward by the musical sound of certain lines and I write them, and there's always a point where the poem, like a living thing, sort of quickens and and pushes back. I mean, to borrow an, an image from the visitation, it sort of kicks in the womb, you know, it leaps for joy, it, it has its own life. And then when a poem is born that way, what 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 it does is it hopefully it it, it has rich things to say to other people, but it has them to say to me as well. I learned something from the poem. The poem has become something, something more. And I think that that power of a work of art, whether it's a poem or a piece of prose writing or a painting, to, to quicken with a life of its own and to have more than it has, as it were, to contain more than you put into it, to make more available than you thought was available when you start to write it. That seems to me to be a sign of the work of God, the spirit in the world and, and, and the, the sort of the sort of overplusness of God himself. And so so writing has been not so much uh, expressing absolutely what I know as exploring and discovering what I half know and still need to learn. I'm going to start with David's Crown, which I I really loved. I have to tell you, I thought, what a wonderful book. I've got to get my copy out too. And and just say, I found it so fascinating, the structure of this book and how you put it together and how it becomes a crown. Would you tell us just a little bit? I mean, this to me was so imaginative. I must say it was also an extraordinary challenge. Well, like like many people, you know, uh, I found the experience of our first really serious lockdown, you know, which was back in, um, started back in March of um, 2020 for us, concentrated the mind. Um, Of course, we could only go out once for for an hour each day. It was really quite a severe lockdown here. And so we loved the hour we had out in nature, but we also, I found my, that my daily reading of the Psalms, which is just, I I have to say, had sometimes become a little bit on, 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 um, on automatic, you know, uh, you're kind of familiar with and it ticks over. Suddenly, the Psalms commanded my attention. They seem to speak from the heart and for the heart, and they seem to speak directly into this crisis. So I kind of knew I would like to write a sort of prayer poetry, a kind of a, a kind of diary of my journey through the Psalms in the form of poetry. But the, the, I, that was remained a vague idea until I found this structure. Each of the poems has 15 lines. It's in five threes. So because it's Hamic pentameter, that's like a little model of the Psalter, you know, in the sense that um, uh, there is there for about 150 syllables in each one. But um, and we've got 150 Psalms, which are also divided into um, uh, fives and threes. Then that is to, that is to say that they're, they're, um, you know, there are f- five books of the Psalter and so on. So. That was that was all there, but I still didn't have it. And then I was rereading the poetry of John Donne, the great, great um, uh, late sixteenth and early seventeenth century poet priest, and he has a very beautiful uh, little sequence of seven sonnets called La Corona. Now I'd always this was obviously before we knew about the coronavirus. La Corona was called Corona because it means crown. I mean the word. Uh, corona is in the word coronation it's the latin word for crown there is a there is a there is a beautiful uh piece of music by Talis called the missa corona spinia the, the 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 mass for the crown of thorns so it's the way it's a crown for dun is that the last line of the first sonnet is the first line of the next one and the last line of that one is the first line and so they're linked like you might link chaplets or flowers and then as you would guess the final line of the final sonnet is the first line of the first sonnet so it makes a crown or coronet and he actually opens it and closes it with the lines deign at my address to christ deign at my hands this crown of prayer and praise and it's quite a delicate thing to do that with seven sonnets so it just a crazy thing occurred to me i said thought to myself what if I did that? But instead of doing it with seven sonnets, I did it with 150 poems. 
And it would mean, of course, that the whole thing would be a corona. And I began to feel that perhaps this corona virus, you know, that there might be a hidden crown in it somewhere, that it might be part of the of the corona spinia, the crown of thorns. So it, it began to make to make sense. And um, what it did was it drew my attention to the links between the Psalms, the sequence. You can go into the Psalter and read it for themes, but part of the ordinal, as we call it, the, 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 um, the lectionary, particularly for priests and deacons in the Church of England, you say a set number of psalms, you know, you go through the Psalter, uh, you set psalms each day, and you don't do it because you're in this mood or that mood, you just go through. And that really made me think, gosh, I've got to know, when I'm reading Psalm 22, I need to know that 23 is coming. When I'm reading 23, I need to look at 24. And of course, to begin the whole thing, which begins, you know, with the Beata's fear, blessed is the man. Before I could write the first line, I had to know what the last line of the whole sequence would be. So I started, even though we were in dire straits and, you know, there were, the, the country was in a parlous state and we were all in fear. But I've started, I prepared myself by reading Psalm 150, the complete explosion of joy and praise. And I got the line, come to the place where every breath is praise, which I thought is the the final invitation of the psalm is into the realm of praise. And I thought, well, that can be a welcoming line. That can be the first line is there. And then after that, it, it, it began almost to write itself. I was absolutely amazed at it. This beautiful crown, this linking, this, this little tricky job you set for yourself but you yeah, execute yeah, it so beautifully you really I love did. form I love form <laughs> I think form actually helps with poetry so so you know the form of the rhyme scheme and the meter as well is all part of helping me not just to splurge on the page but to make something formed and beautiful I hope it had particular meaning for me and it goes way back in my life probably almost 50 years no 45 years ago I created uh, a wall hanging that is a crown in the hands of God. Uh, And uh, it was interesting because at that point I was a starving young artist and someone wanted to buy it and and they did. And then I felt, um, I felt God's rebuke. He said, this was for you. This is what you look like in my hands, a crown in my hands. And it happened to be because we were all together praying. So it wasn't just me alone, but it was what we look like when we joined together. And interestingly enough, the person who had bought it sent me a note and said, I have this strange feeling this is not for me, but it's for you. Oh, Oh, wow. What an an amazing confirmation. And I still have it hanging in my home. Oh, uh, very good. I'll have to send you a picture of it. It's not grand, but it was that message of this crown in the hands of God. And I look at this beautiful work of art that you created in David's crown. Mm. And I just see it resting in God's hands. And it's a kind of fresh and imaginative way to tell people uh, the the marvelous and incredible beauty of the Lord. I I just, I found it fabulous. Is there a poem within it that you would read to us, one or two? Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, One of the things that was really, um, I uh, came through to me, this goes back to our talk about Henry now now, and and, and then the idea of Christ as the plumb line or the connection or the heart. I really felt I came closer to Jesus through the Psalms. I really read them in the spirit that not only he himself had prayed them, but that, um, and obviously the Psalm 22 was on his lips when he was dying uh, uh, and he was fulfilling therefore Psalm 23 and so on. But also that so many of the Psalms seem to look forward to him. He seems to be there both in the suffering figure and in the royal figure that we see in the Psalms. Let me just read you since I'll I'll perhaps read you a couple. I'll read you one, which is the um, one where I specifically ask Christ to come close and offer him the crown, as it were, and say, say, this is the thing I've woven for you. It's number 86 in Clina Domine. So what I did was I read the Psalms in the Coverdale translation, and then I made my poem. And you can read the book two ways. You can either read it straight through as a book of poems, you know, that takes you on a spiritual journey, or you can read it with the Psalms in your hands. And you can read a couple of Psalms and then read the poems, that, and then you see the conversation going on. But anyway, here's, here's my one on Psalm 86. That we may flourish in your tenderness, bow down and hear the whispers of our fear our restless misery, our emptiness without you. Christ, come close to me and hear. 
Come close and comfort me in troubled times. I need your mercy now, for I despair of any other help. The telling chimes of every passing bell might be my own. Lift up my soul and breathe through my poor rhymes that I might lay these lines before your throne, a frail corona wreathed of fading flowers to set against the gold of David's crown, wrought in the pattern of my passing hours. O oh, you who raised me from the depths of hell, Kindle these lines with all your quickening powers. So it's a sort of prayer there. And maybe I, just if I read you one more, I, I, I'd like to, to one of the, the things about the, the whole experience of the lockdown was I think we came back to nature in a new way. You know, the skies were clean and clear of all the airline traces and silent. We heard the bird song more. Life was precious, and every you know dewdrop seemed seemed extraordinary. And uh, I had several experiences of that sense of almost coming to the brink of things and getting something glimmering through them. You know, George Herbert puts it very beautifully when he says, "A man that looks on glass, on it may stay his eye, or if he pleaseth, through it pass, and then the heavens espy." So I'd, I'd like to read you my take on Psalm 27, which is the famous, you know, Dominus Illuminatio, so, so lighten, lighten us. And it has one of my, my favorite verses anywhere in the Bible, which is, my heart has said of him, seek his face, your face, Lord, I will seek. Which is amazing when you think of it coming in the Old Testament like that, you know, and Moses couldn't look on the no man's, I mean, no man sees my face and lives. And yet, what can I do but ask to see your face? So this is a poem about vision, about looking, about looking with new eyes. And it's, it's Dominus Illuminatio, my poem on Psalm 27. Oh, let me see with his eyes from now on, whose gaze on beauty makes it beautiful who looks us into love and looks upon his whole creation with a merciful and loving eye. My heart has said of him, seek out his face. I've sensed his bountiful presence shimmering behind the dim veil of things. That presence calls to me, calls me to tremble at the brink and rim of lived experience. And then to free myself of fear, to trust him and to dive right off that brink into his mystery, into that deep and holy sea of love in which the living worlds all float and swim, to dare each moment's death that I might live. <laughs> lovely, lovely, lovely. You know, I, I read in Sounding the Seasons on the cover, there's a lovely comment from Ron Williams, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Malcolm Geet knows exactly how to use the sonnet form to powerful effect. These pieces have the economy and pungency of all good sonnets and offer deep resources for prayer and meditation. In his own words, brevity, clarity, concentration, and a capacity for paradox are typical of the best sonnet sequences. And all these qualities are to be found here. This is on the front page of Sounding the Seasons, 70 Sonnets for the Christian Year. I took your advice. I picked this up and I read it from cover to cover. I wept at different points. I, I found fresh meaning for different moments within the church year. I was, it was a it was delicious. What can I say? Um, yeah, no, it was just a, a lovely, lovely treat. I'm, I'm glad you said delicious there because I think poetry <laughs> should be should be a sensual experience as well as you know a poetic or a spiritual one. I think you should taste poetry on the tongue. So, so delicious will do very well. <laughs> Sorry, go on. I interrupt. You. No, no. I just I, I just thought that I would ask. Um, you know, within this, I would say I hear your double vocation. You're a, you are a priest and a poet. What is it like to have that? And who inspires you? Because I think there are many throughout time, but also just tell me a little bit about that double vocation that you have. Yeah. I mean, it is. I now feel that it is a double vocation in the full sense that I feel that the priest and poet are, as it were, two sides of the same coin, that they are the same thing in me. But I didn't always feel that. 
I mean, f- partly because, of course, when I first began to want to be a poet, um, which was when I, I, I sort of fell in love with the poetry of Keats as a teenager and wanted to sort of sound like that. I was not at that point a Christian. I'd been brought up in a Christian household, but I'd sort of, you know, done the classic moody teenage rebellious thing and said, you know, I don't believe any of that. And eventually, of course, God called me back and I became a, a much fuller believer in a sense than I had been before. But um, partly because I had rejected my faith and there was a big gap in my life, poetry filled that gap and because I didn't believe again yet I still couldn't accept that it was actually the case uh, the, the faith so I uh, I wanted to be a poet first then when I did return to faith and when in mother to my amazement within that faith having become a, an adult Christian and being confirmed in a in a service in 1980 gra- gradually over the course of the 80s I began to feel this call to priesthood, and I wasn't really sure about it, but eventually I, I began to to test it, and I was ordained uh, a deacon in 1990 and a priest in 91. Now, I hadn't published much poetry at that point, but I was writing it, and um, I found my priestly vocation in itself so fulfilling and so demanding, particularly the pastoral side of it, and so much to learn and to do, that for a while I put poetry aside, and what I discovered when I did that, I wasn't. I, this wasn't like Jared Manley Hopkins being told by his superiors, you know, you cannot write poetry for the next step. But there was about seven years, my first seven years, as it were, of sort of toiling in the vineyard, where I might have written the occasional poem, but I, the priest side of it was really full. And what I discovered, of course, was that the very thing I was trying to do in poetry, not very well, but trying, uh, which in poetry, I was trying to make a shape of words to bring people into a house of words, take them on a journey and send them out from the house of words, the poem transformed and blessed with a rich language that had entered into their souls. That's what I, I think a poem is trying to do. Well, of course, I got to do that with far more success because it was the beautiful literature. Every week I invited people into, into, into the house of God. We celebrated the rich and beautiful liturgy. I was able to pronounce the words of Jesus himself. And together through that, that the poetry of liturgy, we were transformed. Also in poetry, you're listening to the music behind the words and you're trying to respond line by line. And I found that pastorally, my poet's ear tuned to hear what's really going on behind a a set of words actually worked quite well pastorally, trying to listen to people tell me their troubles. And often I would be able to find a phrase for them and say, is it like this? Might this be what you want to say? And they'll go, oh God, that's it. You know, so then, so in a weird way, some of the poetic part of me was coming out and being fulfilled in the priestly part. But, and this is really sort of quite significant, I think, after seven years of very intense work as a priest um, in two different parishes, I actually got quite close to burnout. I was simply overdoing it. And I also found that my, 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 my springs were running dry. You know, I wasn't still in touch with the deepest things. And, um, you know, partly as I was on too many committees, but there you go. Uh, so <laughs> so um, my bishop kindly, he saw my distress and he kindly gave me three months of sabbatical and said, you can do what you like, you know, uh, what do you need to do? And I suddenly thought, golly, I really need to read poetry. I need to go back to the wellsprings. I need to go back to the poets I love most and just read them again. Not to write essays or be clear, just just to let their words soak into my soul. And I did that very intensely for three months. And um, I found it completely renewed me. And what I found then was that the other vocation, the poet's vocation, kind of came swimming across and joined hands with the priest's vocation and said, look, we're on the same team here write poems as well as, you know, make the time in your life to do this. And the person who in the poetic canon, but also in the, the kind of, if you like, canon of the, the saints of the Church of England, who, who became for me the exemplar of what that is and how to do it. And the, the, the very example that it was possible, that person was George Herbert. So George Herbert, um, a 17th century priest poet, um, who didn't, his poems weren't published till after he died. 
but he faithfully served his parish in this little church in Bemerton. But he also wrote these incredibly honest poems, mostly addressed directly to Christ, often in a dialogue form, a kind of back and forth. And I, the more I read Herbert, the more I felt encouraged equally in my poetic and priestly vocations. So he remains a kind of uh, patron saint for me. Uh, uh, you know, uh, indeed, I, um, I, I, I wrote a, a, a sort of poem for George Herbert in tribute to him. And I also wrote a whole book um, or a whole poetry sequence called After Prayer, which was just poems responding to one George Herbert poem. (laughs) (laughs) He's clearly woven his way through. I could see that as I was reading um, Lifting the Veil. I mean, I could see the the various influences. But how wonderful. This particular book, The the Sounding the Seasons, um, which is... uh, you know, sonnets, yeah. the sonnets. Yeah. yeah. Why did you choose sonnets? Why you well, you're good at limiting yourself, aren't you? You really yeah. say, okay, I, I'll I, stick well, to this. it's interesting. I I, <laughs> I I am good at limiting myself, and it's necessary because, as you may have noticed, when I've given you slightly longer answers than you might be expecting to shorten the questions, I have a tendency to go on a bit. You know, I I have flow. Now that's fine, but you can have too much of it. You know, my mother used to say to me when I was a, a boy, she said. You have the gift of the gab very galloping. But she also used to say, your tongue will get you hung. You know, and anyway, um, I discovered that the discipline of form, the whole point about a sonnet is it's only 14 lines. You can see the last line on the page before you read the first one. If you're writing a sonnet, you know where you have to stop. That concentrates things. I mean, there's a line, I think it's in um, A Winter's Tale, maybe or tell us, where one of the characters in Shakespeare says... Our poetry is a current which flies each bound it chafes. So that's the image of a river flowing, but it's flowing in a channel. And part of the force and flow of the river is the channel. And you get when when the when the bank of the channel turns and the water hits it, you get this fine spray. But that's what makes the river exciting to look at as it moves around. Now, uh, if you didn't have the banks, but you had the well just springing out and there was nothing there and no slope and no channel, it would just be a long, big, splurgy lake or a, or a muddy puddle. It needs the channel. So I particularly find that the form gives force uh, to the flow and contains it and gives it form. Also, I think the form of the sonnet itself is simply a very beautiful form. And I love the tradition of it. So when I write a sonnet, I know that George Herbert wrote sonnets and John Donne wrote sonnets. And of course, supremely, I know that Shakespeare wrote sonnets. And I know that Shakespeare wrote a sonnet sequence in which certain themes recur again and again and are taken from different angles. And so I became aware not only of the sonnet, but of the sonnet sequence as a form which is a tradition in which I could participate, which I could could illuminate a little bit, uh, to which in my own small way I could add some some little branch to the great unfolding tree of it. Um, So all those things made it attractive. But I remember when I first started to write these sonnets in Sounding the Seasons, they arose in and through and out of a a church community. I mean, I, I dedicated them, I think, to, I said, to the glory of God and for the household of faith at St. Edward King and Martyr Cambridge, among whom these sonnets first lived and breathed. And what happened was that I was a priest there. I was an assistant priest there. And and, um, we had a tradition of a secular reading. So we had two scripture readings and the sermon was always from the from the scripture. But we had a secular reading from from the world of literature there or uh, which we would just put in by way of a comment or a sidelight or a kind of, uh, you know, reference that the preacher might want to make so that the sermon might be a conversation between the traditionally received gospel thing and something more contemporary. And it was my job in the church to find these readings and put them together and reflect them on the gospel. So I did that for a year or two. And then I began to run out of them. And I I began to think, well, maybe I could do this. Maybe I could write something, you know, it's Pentecost or, you know, it's Epiphany one or whatever. I'll look at the readings. And these poems began to emerge. It got to the point where sometimes I said in the sonnet what I really wanted to say in the sermon. So occasionally on our, on our more formal eight o'clock service, you know, Book of Common Press service, uh, after the readings, which had inspired the sonnet in the first place, I would just read the sonnet. And one of the congregation remember taking me aside and saying, Malcolm, he said, Hurry, Malcolm, 
why didn't you tell us sooner that you could do it in just 14 lines? And I could think, you know, they've been enduring these 25 minute sermons from me, but actually, you know, so, so I began to feel that brevity might indeed be the soul of wit. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I, I'm sure there's a lot of congregants out there that say, I wish that somebody <laughs> would bring it down into something condensed like that. I have a few favorites in here. Can I request a reading? Uh, oh, yeah. I had many favorites, but I loved Emmanuel on page 13. I loved Cleansing the Temple on 34. Would you would you read a couple yeah. of them, Malcolm? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. So Emmanuel is the seventh in a little mini sequence within it of the Advent antiphons. And the last of them is to call, they're all calling on Christ with terms that, as it were, come out of the Old Testament world, but show who he is. And then find like he's a light, he's a key, he's a king, he's a flame, he's a root, all of those things. But then finally, on the last one, O Emmanuel, we get his name, we get God with us. And um, this poem sums up all the other images in the antiphons uh, and comes to Christ. So, O Emmanuel. And of course, it's got the Advent theme. Advent means come, uh, Advent. The Vanius in, in Advent is the Latin for come. So come, 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 Lord. It's what all these things say. O Emmanuel, O come, O come, and be our God with us. O long sought withness for a world without. O secret seed, O hidden spring of light, come to us, wisdom. Come, unspoken name. Come, root and key and king and holy flame. Oh, quickened little wick, so tightly curled, be folded with us into time and place. Unfold for us the mystery of grace and make a womb of all this wounded world. Oh, heart of heaven beating in the earth. Oh, tiny hope within our hopelessness. Come to be born, to bear us to our birth, to touch a dying world with new-made hands and make these rags of time our swaddling bands. I love it. I love it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I Sorry. also said 34. Am I asking too much? I just, you no, know, I'm going to be greedy and say it. <laughs> Um, the cleansing of the temple. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is part of a sequence for Holy Week. And the whole heart of it, really, this particular bit of the poems, is the idea that although we read in the gospel about the events of Holy Week and Jesus coming to Jerusalem and coming through and on this particular day in Holy Week, cleansing the temple, we read in one sense about what happened out there and back then, as we would with any historical figure. But of course, the difference is that the person we're reading about is alive and present to us right now and is God as well as man. And therefore, whatever Jesus did out there and back then, he can and should do in here and right now. As I think, uh, you know, one of the church fathers said, what he has done for us, he must do in us. So that's the the, the idea behind this and the other poems in this particular bit of the book, where I'm saying, come here, come to this town. You know, there's a temple here that needs to be cleansed. There's a Jerusalem here. There's a... So, cleansing the temple. Come to your temple here with liberation and overturn these tables of exchange. Restore in me my lost imagination, begin in me for good, the pure change. Come as you came, an infant with your mother, that innocence may cleanse and claim this ground. Come as you came, a boy who sought his father, with questions asked and certain answers found. Come as you came this day, a man in anger, unleash the lash that drives a pathway through, face down for me the fear, the shame, the danger, teach me again to whom my love is due. Break down in me the barricades of death and tear the veil in two with your last breath. Beautiful, beautiful. beautiful. So, of course, I, was, I was thinking as I wrote that poem about 
this out there and back then is also in here and right now. But it suddenly occurred to me that, of course, when we get the story in the gospel of Jesus cleansing the temple and overturning the tables and, you know, making a space, taking away the barrier that stopped people from getting through, um, that wasn't his first visit to the temple. And of course, I thought, do you know, let me just think about this. He comes as a little baby in his in his mother's arms at the at the, uh, at, at the um, circumcision, the, maybe with the dedication. Yeah, the dedication. Eight, eight and days. then and then he comes as a little boy when he stays behind and he's in, they they lose him and they find him in the temple and start answering a question. Then he comes, you know, to do this big job of cleansing the temple. And I thought, well, maybe is that it? And I thought, no, no, there's another thing. And I suddenly remember that astonishing detail in the Gospels, in the account of Christ, that when Jesus breathes his last and breathes the breath of life back into God, we're told, and the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And that was the veil between the, the, the sanctuary and the sanctus sanctorum, the Holy of Holies. You remember in the temple law, only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies only once a year on the Day of Atonement with the blood of the lamb on his on his on his body and then the name sewn, you know that was a curtain that nobody could pass through and when the gospel tells us that when jesus died that veil was torn in two from top to bottom they're telling us that we are going through into the holy of holies with 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 jesus and of course that's picked up in hebrews seeing we have a great high priest who has passed into the heavens jesus the son of god you know so it was wonderful just sitting down to write the poem itself made me suddenly see how all these different parts of the gospel all work together. Oh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Well, Lifting the Veil, this is a truly wonderful book. I loved it. I am going to recommend it to everybody. Imagination and the Kingdom of God. This is the new one, and it's yeah. rich. May I read a little portion here that you wrote in this book? I think it's sort of the purpose that you state in this book. I want to make the case for a recovery and reintegration of the imagination together with the reason, together with the reason as modes of knowing. And further, I want to affirm that the healing of that split, the reconciliation of that division is to be found in the incarnation, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He comes not only to save us from our sins, but also heal the tragic fracture in our ways of knowing. I love this book. It just, it pr pronounces a yes to creativity. It pronounces a yes to the imagination where we meet God. Tell me about how this has come about. <laughs> Tell me, it's obviously deep well, in you. It's, yeah, it's very much, I mean, uh, thank you for reading that passage. That's really from the heart. And in a way, the passage you chose very much is the core of the book, how reason and imagination can come back together, but actually come back together in and through Christ and in our approach to Christ. That It's a very, um, it's a book about imagination and creativity, but it's a Christocentric book about imagination. <laughs> yeah, it's very much my heart stuff. Now, it came about, in a sense, it's got a long story and a short story, you know. The long story behind it is my own awareness, really growing up, that I was living in a split world and that there was supposedly these cold, objective, scientific facts out there in the world of objectivity. But they were all quantities and ma mathematical rules and and particles were whizzing about in space but they had no 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 there were no values there was no love or care you know so when i look for the things that actually make life worth living you know love and insight and beauty and and music they said oh, well that's fine you can have that malcolm but that's all subjective that's all just private subjective and of course we had this split in the ways of knowing where we have only i mean the objective knowledge was privileged with total reality but so-called subjective knowledge was just regarded as merely private and with no actual purchase on the facts. And I just thought that can't be right. I experienced it actually as a, as a schoolboy when I came into the English school system quite late and we had my first chemistry lesson and we did the love, we did the experiment with uh, alkali and acid. So you dip a little piece of litmus paper in and it changes color 
according to like if there's if there's acidic stuff it changes and i'd never done a chemistry i'd never been in a chemistry lab i was astonished i thought the whole thing was beautiful i loved the bunsen burners and the glass tubes and when we dipped the paper in and it changed color right there before our eyes i thought it was magic now i did the experiment just like we were told to do and i wrote up there got the right results and i wrote all the little calculations and exactly how many you know i did all that but instead of writing it just in the form they, they t- I later discovered you're supposed to, I wrote a little essay. I said, this was a great day in my life. This is astonishing. I was amazed when I saw the car. Anyway, when we had the le- we handed the homework in and the next lesson, the, uh, the teacher called me up and I, I thought, oh, he's going to say you did a nice homework. But on the contrary, he called me up to mock and shame me. He took my, my, my piece of work and showed it to the class. And every time I had used the word I... And there's a subject doing this. He crossed it out. And he said, you never use the word I. You never say what you feel. You never do anything. None of these things are real. The only thing that is real is, is this, this substance. You have to say the litmus paper was dipped into the thing, you know, put it passive. It was observed that, but you don't say who did it. And I said, sir, are you telling me that I must write about this as if there were nobody in the room doing it? And he said, yes, that's what science is. And I thought, well, there's something wrong there. You know, there's something missing. So I had experienced this split as a painful thing. And I later discovered that some of my heroes like C.S. Lewis had experienced it. I mean, Lewis writes about his own time when he was an atheist in Oxford saying, you know, the two hemispheres of my mind were in sharpest contrast, you know, on the one side, you know, uh, a many islanded sea of poetry and myth on the other, you know, a dull concatenation of facts about a dying universe. Nearly everything I loved, I believed to be imaginary, nearly everything I believed to be real, I thought grim and meaningless. Now, That split was healed for Lewis in coming to Christ when he found that the world of imagination had been bodied forth in reality, that you both sides of the mind could come together. So that had made me feel someday I need to think about healing these things or or seeing just witnessing to the fact that they are being healed in me in Christ. And I, I started off by writing quite an academic book. I wrote a you know, like a purely academic book called called Faith, Hope and Poetry, uh, Theology and the the Poetic Imagination. And, you know, it sits there on, on, uh, I mean, I hope it's fairly readable, but it's it's the sort of thing that sits, you know, on a a, a university library shelf and people refer to in their PhDs. And you kind of have to do that. That's part of the gig. But having done it, I thought, although that book is about reason and imagination being brought back together, Because it was an academic book, it had to be more reason than imagination in a way. And so I thought I want the opportunity a bit later in my life when I've moved more and more into the realm of poetry to write the same thing in a way, but with different examples and what and to write it from the heart. And then specifically to appeal not to, you know, bespectacled students who've got to write an essay on it, but to appeal to write the book to creative people, to I was thinking of all these young creatives that you see all over the place, you know, are making music and, and soundtracks and mosaics and films and, and, you know, writing their own poetry. We're trying to say, where did this beautiful thing come from? Is there a God that, 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 that makes it valid? Well, how could, you know, and I was thinking both about creatives who don't have a faith, but also I was thinking about those people who've perhaps come out of quite quite highly regulated and in some respects legalistic churches that perhaps because of their own theological background have been very mistrustful of the imagination or have kind of marginalized it. And I think some people brought up in churches like that find it so crushing that they rebel against it and they actually throw out the baby with the bathwater. They lose their faith. Now there's a lot of, prejudicial junk that might have been in their churches which they would do well to lose but they can't lose jesus so i wanted to say to them look the the jesus you loved is on the side of your imagination not against it and here's why i found myself going that uh malcolm you want to renew the awe in all of us Yes, I give do. it yeah. back by permission. And that's what makes this book such a treat to read. I, I would say to our listeners right now, don't miss it. You will love it. It will enrich your life deeply. Um, when you talk about baptized imagination, and I think that came probably from Lewis. Yes, from um, Lewis. Yeah, the, the artistic imagination, you know, the, the yes 
to the fullness of all of that, which I just really enjoyed. I would love if you would read one of the poems from here. I was thinking about the transfiguration. Would that feel right? Do you, do you want to set yeah. that up a little bit? Yeah. yeah, I'll do that. The transfiguration is one of those very central moments, obviously, in the gospel. I remember when I first um, was reading, you know, when I went to study theology, I I'd originally studied English literature at Cambridge. And then when I experienced my vocation to priesthood, I came back to Cambridge and studied theology. And I think it was a great help to me having studied literature first. It gave me a different way into the Bible. But I remember reading a, a, one of those annoying, um, rather debunking kind of commentaries, I think, on Luke's gospel, um, where the, the high-minded commentator, you know, the high-handed commentator, reading about the account of the transfiguration and Jesus shining white and the glory on the mountain and Moses and Elijah, he says, well, this is clearly a misplaced resurrection narrative which I thought was rather astonishing. He said, like, as though St. Luke had just made an accident with the cut and paste, you know, he put it where he didn't. So I was annoyed by this commentary, but I thought, wait a minute, there's something, it is a resurrection narrative. There's something about the full glory of the spiritual body. And yet Jesus hasn't died yet. It's like a glimmering. It's like a hint. It's like a lifting of the veil of what the glory is to be, you know, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And then I thought it's not misplaced. It's not misplaced at all. It's there because when they come down from that holy mountain, he's going to set his face like Flint to go to Jerusalem. And Peter's going to say, oh, heaven forbid. And he's going to say, get them behind me. I've got to go. He's going to take them in. They're going to see this man utterly scorned, shamed, humiliated, stripped, beaten, the flesh torn off his back. They're going to see him exposed, you know, in, 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 in on the cross. And the, everybody who does that to him is going to be telling them, see, there's nothing in him. He's just another miserable sinner like the rest of you. There you go. You hope for the wrong thing. And maybe their faith is going to break as they do that. But look what God does. Before the time of trial, he gives them the glimpse of glory. You know, we're told for the, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross just for a minute. They see it. And I came to feel more and more that God gives us those again and again that, that I mean, one day, I really believe the veil will be lifted completely. You know, the earth will be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. As Jesus says, you won't need to point and say, look, there he is or there he is, or he's, because the coming of Christ will be like lightning from the east to the west. One day it's going to be abundantly clear. But that day is not, has not yet come. We're in a kind of pre-dawn dark. But to keep us going, God has given us in all kinds of ways little moments of transfiguration. The burning bush is one. There's the, there's the glory shining out, yet it's still the bush. And I began to feel that perhaps in God's divine providence, by the gift of imagination, which is part of his image in us, the particular job of some poets and writers might be to give us those glimpses to keep us going. So that was all kind of going on. So my poem on the transfiguration is kind of voiced for one of the disciples, either Peter, James or John, you know, who've been up on the mountain and are now actually looking at the cross under the, the sky is dark, you know, darkness covers the whole sky. They're looking at, as at the end of the poem, it says this blackened sky, this darkened sky. That's what he can see in front of him. But what he can remember is this joyful glimpse of how things really are. So here's the poem, Transfiguration. For that one moment in and out of time, on that one mountain where all moments meet, the daily veil that covers the sublime in darkling glass fell, dazzled at his feet. There were no angels full of eyes and wings, just living glory, full of truth and grace. The love that dances at the heart of things shone out upon us, from a human face. And to that light, the light in us leapt up. We felt it quicken somewhere deep within, a sudden blaze of long extinguished hope trembled and tingled through the tender skin. Nor can this blackened sky, this darkened scar, eclipse that glimpse of how things really are. Oh, lovely, lovely, lovely. 
I came across something and I couldn't quite sort out whether you had written it or your friend wrote it about your poem, but I thought it was such a great description. It said, your poetry jostles the soil of the imagination. I loved that phrase. And I think you have jostled the soil of our imagination as you read to us. I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled. I, I uh, have loved the opportunity. There's much more that I would like to to talk about, but I don't know whether you have more time that you can give. Perhaps, perhaps we should we should we should do do one more poem just to sort of um, bring it to close. The the jostling the soil of the imagination story. By the way, that's a phrase I borrowed. There's a very very fine uh, contemporary Irish poet called Michael O'Shiel, who's just published his masterpiece. It's called uh, Five Quintets, but he once described poetry as jostling the soil of the imagination, so that it becomes good ground, you know, into which into which the seed can fall. Um, well, maybe maybe um, if I were to read um, one poem, it's um, obviously the very fact that we're doing this, you know, remotely. Uh, okay. I mean, at one point I was hoping to come to Toronto and be with you all at uh, Henry Nouwen Conference and everything. Oh, and yes. That couldn't happen because, because of, um, you know, because of the pandemic. And um, I do think there's both crisis and opportunity um for us in all of this and you know the breakdown is sometimes breakthrough so if i may i'd like to read you a poem i wrote called easter 2020 so we we were locked down completely in march on march the 13th well 20th i think march the 20th suddenly everything closed including all the churches nobody could go to church and i like many people found this particularly painful on easter day because Easter is supremely the day one makes one's communion and receives Christ in the bread and wine. And when one proclaims to one's neighbor, the Lord is risen, he has risen indeed, hallelujah. And we embrace one another because he's not only risen in the bread and wine, he's risen in, in us and in each other. And we greet each other in Christ and Christ in each other. So to be at home on that morning of all mornings was, was going to be a kind of very strange thing. So, Late on the Holy Saturday, um, the day before Easter Sunday, I sat up and wrestled with this in my mind. And I, I, I'm, I asked the question, the open question, where is Jesus this strange Easter day? And I suddenly found a whole poem came in, in response. And it very much embodies my sense that although I love to write about my beloved Christ in poetry, and I love to see paintings and music, and I love to go to church and all of those things. They're all very helpful expressions, but Jesus is alive. He's not a tame lion. He's where he wants to be. He's doing what he needs to do. He breaks through every barrier, and he becomes um, new in the world in all kinds of ways. So this is my poem, Easter 2020. And where is Jesus this strange Easter day? not lost in our locked churches any more than he was sealed in that dark sepulcher. The locks are loosed, the stone is rolled away, and he is up and risen long before, alive, at large, and making his strong way into the world he gave his life to save. No need to seek him in his empty grave. He might have been a wafer in the hands of priests this day, or music from the lips of red-robed choristers. Instead, he slips away from church, shakes off our linen bands to don his apron with a nurse. He grips and lifts a stretcher, soothes with gentle hands the frail flesh of the dying, gives them hope, breathes with the breathless, lends them strength to cope. On Thursday, we applauded, for he came and served us in a thousand names and faces, mopping our sick room floors and catching traces of that corona which was death to him. Good Friday happened in a thousand places where Jesus held the helpless, died with them, that they might share his Easter in their need. Now they are risen with him risen indeed he is risen indeed thank you malcolm oh my goodness this has been this has been a feast for me it's been an absolute feast for me you wrote at the very end of 
lifting the veil. When the poetic imagination removes the film of familiarity, when it rinses and cleanses the source of our seeing and reveals breathtaking beauty in Christ and the world he loves, we respond to beauty with a longing for goodness. The poetic imagination does not simply rouse the moral imagination, it becomes it. Thank you for your gifts, for your obedience to these gifts. Uh, thank you for sharing with us how Henry has been, you know, a friend to you through through your thank life you. too. That means a great deal to us. And I just, I thank you for this time. I'm really honored. And I want to tell the people that are listening, do by all means go to our website. We will make sure that all, there's links to everything that we've talked about today. This has been a, a, a treat and you're going to want to read more. I know that. Thank you so much for being with us and thank you. Malcolm Guy, what a treat it has been for me to talk with you today. Thank, Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. Oh, I hope you come away from this interview with Malcolm Guy, filled, inspired, and challenged. To really know this very talented artist and experience the fullness of the gift of his creativity, we will post links in our notes to Malcolm Guy's website and to the books we discussed today. If you enjoyed today's podcast, oh, we'd be so grateful if you'd take time to give us a stellar review or a thumbs up or share it with your friends and family. Be sure to take time to visit our website where you're going to find links to any content, resources, or things discussed in this episode. Check on the link, Books to Get You Started, in case you're new to the writings of Henry Nowen. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe, give us a thumbs up, or follow us on social media for more Henry Nowen content. For books, videos, and other resources, or if you'd like to receive free daily Henry Nouwen e-meditations, you can follow the links below.